Hello, my name is Douglas Kilfoyle and in this short presentation I want to introduce our module on the International Criminal Court. Now, before we turn to considering the court itself and its history and origins, it's useful to briefly put it in context once again of the United Nations system. So, the United Nations as a body has three principal organs. The Security Council, with responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security and certain compulsory powers to take measures in respect of peace and security under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The General Assembly, which can, as it were, discuss any international matter but has very limited compulsory powers, but establishes bodies such as the Human Rights Council with a role in monitoring human rights compliance, and then the judicial arm, the International Court of Justice, the principal dispute resolution body. And we've noted in previous uh, classes how the Security Council used its powers in respect of international peace and security to set up the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Now, when it comes to developing a new international criminal court, the question is, how should it fit into the UN system? Should it be a part of the UN system or should it be a freestanding body? And if it is a freestanding body, should it have a particular relationship with the International Court of Justice, the General Assembly, or most particularly the Security Council? because many of the situations that will give rise to crimes within the jurisdiction of the court will also have an international peace and security dimension, particularly as we'll see later in respect of the crime of aggression. So there's a question about how to fit the International Criminal Court into the existing governance architecture of the international system. So how did we get to the current International Criminal Court? Well, the idea of an International Criminal Court had been debated for some time, but most recently, in 1994, the International Law Commission came up with a draft statute for a court, and the final uh, rapporteur on that work was uh, Professor James Crawford, uh, an Australian lawyer with a long um, tenure at Cambridge and now a judge of the International Court of Justice. Then, following that draft statute, the United Nations set up a preparatory commission, so a commission that would do further work on the idea of a court before what's called a general diplomatic conference, a gathering of states and, especially in the case uh, of the Rome Statute, non-government organisations, uh, to consider how best to draft a statute for uh, the International Criminal Court. This led to the 1998 Rome Conference, a gathering that had the express mandate of settling the statute for the International Criminal Court. So it's often referred to as the Rome Statute. And as I've said, while many international organisations and non-government organisations were present at the Rome Conference, only states had the legal authority to conclude the statute. And that's because, in the end, the Rome Statute was concluded as a treaty so fundamental principles of treaty law from earlier sessions, a treaty is binding only upon the states that become party to it, only upon its members. So the International Criminal Court, while it has to some extent a relationship with the United Nations, is itself a completely separate international organisation that is not in any formal way subordinate to the United Nations, with one possible exception regarding the Security Council that we'll come to. So what were the key issues at the Rome Conference? Well, there was a significant debate about what crimes should be within the jurisdiction of an international criminal court. So there have been prosecutions before uh, the international criminal tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda for crimes of genocide, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, in a sense, those broad categories aren't controversial, but which specific crimes should be included were was in each case potentially a source of controversy. How wide should the ambit of included war crimes be? How would one draft the elements required of crimes against humanity? 
Um, genocide, in a sense, is perhaps the least controversial inclusion, though as we'll see in later classes, there were still some issues to be settled. And most controversially, would the court have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, the crime of aggressive war that was prosecuted at Nuremberg? And as we'll see later, that issue proved so difficult that in the end, uh, the principle was accepted that the court should in principle have jurisdiction over aggression, but the Rome Statute entered force without aggression being defined. There was a placeholder provision put in the Rome Statute saying that the assembly of the state parties, the gathering of states who became full members of the Rome Statute, would at a later date settle a definition for aggression, which has now in fact occurred. There was also the question of what should be the correct relationship between this International Criminal Court and national courts. So would it be a court with primacy, a court of primary jurisdiction as the ICTY and ICTR had been, a court which could take cases as it were, or take priority in cases and remove them from a national jurisdiction? Or should it have a more cooperative or deferential relationship towards national jurisdictions? Uh, in a sense, should it be a court of last resort? Should it only act when national courts cannot? And the word that came to be used to encapsulate that relationship was complementarity. The International Criminal Court should not be have primacy over national jurisdictions, but should complement them. Then there was the question of the role of the prosecutor. Should there be a completely independent prosecutor, or should the prosecutor be only be able to act with the supervision of, for example, the UN Security Council, or, perhaps less controversially, organs of the court itself, um, such as a trial chamber. So a particular concern here from the United States, uh, perhaps more strongly than any other state party to the negotiations, was the possibility of a politically motivated or rogue prosecutor who would bring ideologically motivated prosecutions against uh, nationals of particular states. And finally, there was the question of what to do about the Security Council, given its mandate in respect of international peace and security. That is, it's the Security Council that within the UN system has the primary duty to establish when there have been uh, breaches of the peace, threats to the peace or acts of aggression, and what international measures should be taken as a response. So should it, in a sense, always be able to take the lead in these areas and decide whether prosecutions are in the interest of international peace and security or not? And again, this was quite controversial for states who were not permanent members of the Security Council, because any large role for the Security Council would, as it were, confer special powers of veto on the five permanent members of the Security Council the victors in uh, the Second World War, being um, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China. Why should these five states, the permanent members of the Security Council, be given particular veto powers over the operation of a completely separate international body? So we then come to the question of, all right, we've negotiated the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. What does the ICC have jurisdiction over. So, it has jurisdiction over persons for the most serious crimes of international concern, as Article 1 tells us, and that translates into jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and aggression under Article 5. Although, as we've noted, Article 5 originally contains a placeholder, aggression cannot be prosecuted until a definition is settled at a later date. Now, other than these uh, first questions of, as it were, gravity and the covered crimes, there's a temporal limitation. So the ICC can only prosecute acts within its jurisdiction that occurred after the statute enters force. And we'll recall from earlier sessions that under the law of treaties, there is a distinction between signature of a treaty text, ratification of a treaty text, formal consent to be bound, and then the treaty coming into force and having force of law, which is normally dependent on a certain number of ratifications being achieved as set out in the treaty itself. So 
The Rome Statute only enters force on 1 July 2002, and that, as it were, is the start date for its temporal jurisdiction. Then it also has jurisdiction only where a member state is the territorial state where the conduct physically occurred, or where a member state is the state of nationality of the alleged perpetrator. Now, uh, that's spelled out in Article 12, and we'll note later the capacity for non-state parties to opt into the court's jurisdiction under Article 12.3. Um, now, in addition to these limitations on subject matter jurisdiction, temporal jurisdiction, and the territoriality and nationality principles, the court is said to have a complementary jurisdiction to national courts. That is, the International Criminal Court will only have jurisdiction where a state with jurisdiction is unable or unwilling genuinely to carry out an investigation or prosecution. So there is, in effect, a presumption against the ICC taking jurisdiction unless that unable or unwilling test is made out. Um, and then there's finally a requirement that under Article 17.1d, the court must declare inadmissible a case which is not of sufficient gravity to justify further action. So there's a gravity requirement, and where that line is to be drawn has also proven controversial. Now, a question that we can come back to in class is that, you know, it's often said that the International Criminal Court fails to go after great powers. And sometimes this is summed up by saying, why doesn't the International Criminal Court prosecute former President Bush of the United States and former Prime Minister Blair of the United Kingdom. And the incidents normally thought of are military action in Afghanistan in, uh, following the events of September 11, 2001, and following the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003. And this can lead to a number of technical questions. What crimes might be applicable? Well, if we're thinking about the invasion of a country, the first crime we might think of is aggression. But remember the Rome Statute entered into effect without a definition of aggression in place. Would the ICC have jurisdiction? Well, certainly in respect of crimes committed on the territory of Afghanistan and Iraq, we have to ask when did those states become parties to uh, the ICC statute? And if we're thinking about nationals, if we're saying that certain high leaders or generals could be prosecuted for decisions uh, that they took in the course of those conflicts, we have to remember that the uh, United States of America never became a party. So of the two jurisdictions, only the United Kingdom would be bound by the Rome Statute. And then we have to remember that there's the question of activation date, that we could only look at, at crimes after 2002, any alleged crimes. So one can go through a number of these uh, incidents uh, or examples and ask, well, on what basis would the International Criminal Court exercise jurisdiction or not? And we'll look at some of those real-world examples in class. But we should note that the International Criminal Court has in fact begun, for example, investigations into whether member states of the ICC were involved or implicated in international crimes in Afghanistan, but only in the course of conflict in Afghanistan after 2002. And we can also ask the practical question, does the ICC ever prosecute great powers? What might be the obstacles to it, uh, not just legally, but politically, in conducting such cases? All right, now, there's the further question then of, all right, these are the things within the jurisdiction of the court or its limitations upon jurisdiction, but how might cases actually commence? And typically, Analysis of the court uh, is conducted in a language of there being three trigger mechanisms. So Article 13 talks about the exercise of jurisdiction. If the court has, in theory, jurisdiction, when can it be exercised? So the court may exercise its jurisdiction with respect to a crime referred to in Article 5 in accordance with the provisions of this statute if A a situation in which one or more such crimes appears to have been committed and is referred to the prosecutor by a state party. So, as drafted, this seems to contemplate the idea that a member state of the ICC would say, 
prosecutor, we believe crimes have occurred in that other member state over there and you should investigate. B, a situation in which one or more such crimes appears to have been committed is referred to the prosecutor by the Security Council acting under Chapter 7. So here's the possibility of in first possibility for involvement by the Security Council. So the statute acknowledges or confers upon the Security Council a power to refer situations to the ICC. Now, in a sense, this is pragmatic in terms of uh, the design of the international system as a whole, because if the Security Council has the power to set up ad hoc courts and tribunals, as we've seen in the past, why could it not confer power on an existing court to examine a particular situation? And the third possibility is that the prosecutor initiates an investigation in respect of such a crime. So this is called often the proprio motu power of the prosecutor, the prosecutor's ability to commence an investigation uh, on their own motion, on their own authority. So let's go through these in a little more detail. In summary, the three situations are the ICC can initiate, the ICC prosecutor, him or herself, can initiate an investigation. There can be a UN Security Council referral or there can be a referral by a state of a situation occurring in a member state. Now, as drafted, that appears to be, as it were, contemplated to be referring something happening in another state, but in practice, so-called self-referrals have been common. States have said to the court, we would like you to investigate a situation occurring within our own territory. Uh, now, one important point to note here is that states can only refer situations. They cannot say, uh, we want you to investigate war crimes committed only by this rebel insurgent group. What they can say is that, you know, we refer a particular situation occurring in our territory um, and the prosecutor will then go on to identify the crimes um, which will be further investigated. All right, so let's consider the prosecutor-initiated cases. So, as we've said, this is often called the proprio motu power. Uh, now, when this was designed as part of the Rome Statute, there were delegations that were concerned that a prosecutor uh, might act completely unsupervised and engaged and engage in politically motivated prosecutions. So, therefore, to use the proprio motu power, the office of the prosecutor, or the OTP, has to have the authorization of an ICC pre-trial chamber. And that means that the prosecutor has to persuade the pre-trial chamber that there is a reasonable basis to proceed with an investigation. Um, further, the prosecutor is limited um, by the bounds of complementarity, and we'll go into that in more detail in class, outside these video lectures. And interestingly, there have only been three such situations where the prosecutor has acted of his or her own motion. A uh, situation in Kenya, in Cote d'Ivoire, and Georgia. We might ask why. Um, well, it, in practice, is going to be very difficult for a prosecutor to gather evidence and build a case without the active support of the territorial state. So actually, as a practical matter, for the prosecutor to proceed without um, the consent uh, or against the wishes of a territorial government is quite risky because the case may collapse and indeed all investigations into the Kenyan uh, electoral violence of 2009 and 2010 have um, failed, at least as substantive cases, though there are some questions about offences against the administration of justice. All right, the next question we need to ask is about the role of the Security Council, which has powers of referral, the second trigger, and deferral, a kind of blocking power. So our key points to note here uh, is this possibility acknowledged in Article 13b of the ICC statute that the Security Council might refer a case, and the Chapter 7 powers of the Security Council under the UN Charter that we've already noted. There's an interesting question here about 
the ability of the Security Council to bind a non-party to the Rome Statute. Let me explain that briefly. So, the first principle of the law of treaties is that treaties have no effect for third parties. They bind only their members, and that includes all the provisions of the Rome Statute, not only about crimes, but investigation, uh, detention, immunities, arrest and surrender, the whole thing. But if the Security Council can set up an international court or tribunal with compulsory powers saying, in effect, all members of the UN are bound under Chapter 7 to cooperate with this court and tribunal, then the Security Council can use those same powers to say members of the United Nations are bound by, for example, the Rome Statute. So the Security Council could order states to comply with the Rome Statute in respect of a particular situation as if they were members and give the Rome Statute force through its Chapter 7 powers. So this is exactly the same in a sense as setting up a new Chapter 7 court or tribunal except you're simply, as it were, cloaking the International Criminal Court in Chapter 7 power. Um, so in theory the Security Council could do that, but the question as to whether it has done so in any particular case will be a question of the wording of that Chapter 7 resolution. So it's possible that the Security Council could have quite wide-ranging effects uh, upon the obligations of a non-member of the International Criminal Court. All right. Um, Article 16 of the ICC statute also contemplates that the Security Council can request a deferral for 12 months of any possible uh, investigation arising out of a particular situation. Um, now, that has occurred in a limited number of cases. Um, so Article 16, the deferral power has been used uh, on a handful of occasions, uh, but not recently. So it was originally feared that the United States might try and use Article 16 through the Security Council to block ICC investigations in a range of situations. But the effect of the resolutions listed there is simply to say that, uh, somewhat controversially, that in respect of certain peacekeeping operations, the International Criminal Court should not act, that any disciplinary investigations would be left to the sending states of peacekeepers. And the legal effectiveness of that attempt to use Article 16 uh, was controversial, but it has not been a long-running issue. There have also been a number of Security Council referrals to the court, uh, under Chapter 7, particularly uh, the referral of the situation in Darfur, Sudan in 2005, and the situation in, arising out of the Libyan civil war in 2011. Now, we then have the state party referral mechanism, the so-called third trigger. Uh, so under Article 14.1, a state party may refer to the prosecutor a situation in which one or more crimes within the jurisdiction of the court appear to have been committed, requesting the prosecutor to investigate the situation for the purpose of determining whether one or more specific person should be charged with commission of such crimes. Uh, so further, uh, under Article 12.3 of the ICC statute, a non-state party may accept the jurisdiction of the court with respect to a crime in question. So a um, non-state party may refer a particular situation to the court, as Cote d'Ivoire did in 2003, and as Palestine did or attempted to do in 2009, before it became a member of the court in 2015. And by far the largest number of cases have come to the court through self-referrals by member states, states saying, we request that the court investigate situations occurring without, within our territory. Such states include Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic, and Mali. All right, 
we now need to consider the organs of the court in a little more detail. So we often speak of the prosecutor, but the body established under the International Criminal Court statute is the Office of the Prosecutor, or the OTP. So the OTP is one arm of the court, along with the chambers, the judicial chambers of uh, the court, consisting of a pre-trial chamber, a trial chamber, and an appeals chamber, and the registry, which provides the court's administrative services. Um, so largely in this course, we're going to be referring either to the Office of the Prosecutor or the chambers. So uh, the pre-trial chamber, trial chamber, and appeal chamber. So the prosecutor, our questions are, uh, when can she act? What duties does she have? What standards of proof are required of her? And what policies might guide decision making? So let's turn to the question, when can the prosecutor act? So we've said that there can be cases of state or security council referral, uh, that she can act on the basis of her proprio motu powers, though those are subject to pre-trial chamber supervision, particularly Article 53.1 on commencing investigation. Um, and one of the uh, further roles of a pre-trial chamber will be in shaping the document containing the charges. So when a prosecutor uh, indicts someone before the International Criminal Court, they will issue the document containing the charges. And the idea here is that uh, the case to be made out and the allegations made against a defendant will be set out in that document, and the details are found in Article 61. And in a sense, the pretrial chamber gets to say, or gets to confirm how the case should be run, what will need to be proved. Nonetheless, and unfortunately rather cumbersomely, it has been the case that often trial chambers have allowed substantial amendment of the documents containing the charges, uh, or even recharacterised them, as has occurred in the Labanga and Katanga case. But we'll come back to that. But essentially, the point to be made here is that the prosecutor doesn't have unfettered freedom to shape how they will run their prosecution. The very nature of the charges to be brought and the evidentiary allegations to be made must be confirmed by the pre-trial chamber and the trial chamber, which in practice means there may well be, as it were, a dialogue between the judges of the court and the prosecutor over how cases will be run. All right, what are the prosecutor's duties? So the prosecutor has an overriding duty to establish the truth, not to secure convictions, and therefore must investigate incriminating and exonerating circumstances equally and make that evidence available to defence counsel. Further, the prosecutor must consider the interests of victims in deciding whether there is a sufficient basis to prosecute, and the prosecutor must take measures to protect the safety, physical and psychological well-being, dignity and privacy of victims and witnesses during investigations and prosecution, through those such measures shall not be prejudicial to or inconsistent with the rights of the accused in a fair and impartial trial under Article 68. Now, that is a difficult collection of duties for the prosecutor to balance. They have to take into account the interests of victims and witnesses, but cannot prejudice the rights of the accused and must uphold a fair and impartial trial. Uh, how those things balance out in particular cases will obviously be a difficult question. All right, what standards of proof are required? So the prosecutor is subject to a number of different standards. So to launch an investigation under Article 53, the prosecutor, if acting under proprio motu powers, has to establish a reasonable basis that uh, a reasonable basis to presume that crimes have been committed and an investigation is warranted. But to issue arrest warrants against particular individuals, you have to show reasonable grounds and that those arrest warrants are necessary for example, to prevent a suspect fleeing or committing further crimes. Uh, confirmation of charges in the document containing the charges will only occur where there is sufficient evidence to establish substantial grounds to believe the crimes have been committed. And at trial to secure a conviction, the prosecutor must have proof beyond reasonable doubt. 
So what can be seen here essentially is that at different stages of the investigatory and prosecutorial process, different and increasingly high standards of proof apply. Now this led to a strategy under the first prosecutor, uh, Mr Moreno Ocampo, of so-called um, focused investigations. So here the idea was that the investigations would be conducted on a rolling basis, gathering more evidence as they went forward, the aim being to meet each of these thresholds as quickly as possible in order to mount cases quickly. Now that led to questions about whether uh, the defence necessarily had adequate notice of all the issues to be raised and whether in fact the prosecutions were um, well planned and well shaped because all the evidence might not be in before critical decisions were taken. Um, now that policy has shifted and under the uh, new prosecutor, uh, Ben Suda, there has been a shift from these focused investigations to a principle of in-depth open-ended investigations outlined in various um, strategic plans and policy papers. But the idea being uh, that a fuller and more holistic approach needs to be taken before making decisions about which cases to prosecute and when. Now, an interesting question then becomes, how does the prosecutor see him or herself? Are they simply a servant of the law? So the first prosecutor, Moreno Acampo, was very keen to say and said frequently, I simply follow the statute. Now, that simply cannot be the case. If only because of resources, the court cannot possibly investigate every situation and every crime where uh, its jurisdiction might be implicated. A court of finite resources cannot do that, at which point choices need to be made. And there are questions about the extent to which the prosecutor must act as a diplomat or a politician. So, for example, uh, it one way of understanding the early approach of the first prosecutor was in a sense that the court had to act in a manner that would reassure permanent members of the Security Council that it wasn't going to be an immediate threat to gain its trust and cooperation. And indeed, there has been much more cooperation with the Security Council over time than one would have perhaps presumed from the initially antagonistic relationship between the court and, its, the, court and the United States. Um, and also, while there's been, while I've noted a significant number of self-referrals as part of the court's workload, Acampo, uh, Moreno Acampo, the first prosecutor, made it plain to the Assembly of State Parties that if the states were to refer their own situations to the court, he would not need to use his proprio motu powers, which certainly looks like an effort to persuade in the manner of a diplomat or a politician. Now, this is not to say it's all been smooth sailing. Uh, particularly, the first prosecutor had a number of um, situations where there was tension between the office of the prosecutor and the pre-trial chambers and trial chambers. Um, now, we've seen, uh, and similarly, the second prosecutor has encountered these issues as well. But, um, for example, uh, the Mavi Mamara uh, incident of 2010, in which Israeli forces boarded a um, vessel at sea, flagged the Cormorus, uh, flagged the Cormorus, which was carrying um, protesters of mixed nationality, but many of them Turkish, in an effort to breach the Israeli naval blockade of Gaza. In the course of that operation, um, a number of protesters were killed and significantly more were injured. Cormorus was a member, is a member of the International Criminal Court, and the events occurred on its flagged vessel, a vessel enjoying its nationality, and so the territorial principle of jurisdiction applied. So Cormorus referred the incident to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor determined that 
there was not a basis, a sufficient basis on which to proceed, um, and did so on the basis of Article 53. So Cormorus then challenged the prosecutor's decision not to uh, proceed and asked that the pretrial chamber review that decision. Now, there was an interesting and technical dispute here about uh, how decisions not to investigate should be made. Now, one ground for not opening an investigation was that the case would be inadmissible under Article 17, and we'll go into admissibility under Article 17 more in class, but essentially the prosecutor could um, decide that uh, a case would be inadmissible, including on grounds that the crimes alleged of insufficient gravity. Now, where the prosecutor takes a decision on the basis of Article 17 admissibility, a pretrial chamber can only request that the prosecutor reconsider. However, the other possible ground for not opening investigation is the investigation would not serve the interests of justice. But a decision on that ground has to be actively confirmed by the um, pretrial chamber. And the majority, in essence, uh, in the Marvi Mamara decision, tried to read down the operation of Article 17 um, as narrowly as it could and said that the prosecutor had in fact not taken into account the fact that uh, the death of a number of activists and the injury of more um, could make out a war crime and this would be sufficiently serious to fall within the statute. Judge Kovacs in dissent said um, this is ridiculous. If we compare it with the situation in Kenya where in post-election violence thousands of people were killed, how can you say, however appalling, that the death of a small handful of people uh, in the course of a single military operation constitutes something grave enough uh, that the court should take jurisdiction? And really one way of seeing this is about how much scope pre-trial chamber should have to supervise the decision-making process of the Office of the Prosecutor. Rather more controversially, there are a number of conflicts between trial chambers and the first prosecutor, including uh, the gathering of evidence through intermediaries. So in the Lubanga case, there was uh, an allegation that um, intermediaries were in effect coaching witnesses or tampering with evidence. And so the defence wanted to call these intermediaries. And the intermediaries, as it were, were those who had conducted investigations and gathered evidence on behalf of the Office of the Prosecutor because the environment in which they were operating would otherwise be too dangerous. And the prosecutor said, in effect, um, no, I don't wish to uh, involve those intermediaries because it will compromise their safety. Uh, similarly, uh, there is um, a power under Article 54 of the ICC statute, again used in the Lubanga case, um, for the prosecutor to gather certain evidence on terms of confidentiality, particularly from international organisations, but only where the purposes um, of that evidence will be to, as it were, lead to new evidence. But there's no intention to use that evidence in the case of itself. Uh, so-called springboard evidence. Now, in effect, in the Lubanga case early on, um, the prosecutor used confidentiality agreements in an overbroad manner uh, and used them very widely indeed. And at one stage, the trial chamber said, you know, your use of these powers and your refusal to cooperate with us means there is no prospect of a fair trial we are suspending proceedings indefinitely. Now, the appeal chamber um, found that, you know, it was for the prosecutor to comply with the trial chamber's rulings and that the trial chamber had certain disciplinary powers that it should have used first rather than granting an indefinite stay, and the Lubanga case continued. But it showed that there was a sort of struggle between uh, the prosecutor and trial chambers over the limits of the prosecutor's powers and whether the prosecutor was 
as it were, the office of the prosecutor was an equal arm of the court with its own powers and duties, or whether, as we would think of it in a domestic system, a prosecutor is an officer of the court who must take directions from the court. And uh, in some of these cases, such as the Marvi Mamara, it's possible to speculate that a tense relationship has at times existed between the trial chambers and the prosecutor. Criticisms of the court. Uh, a, a large one has been that the court appears obsessed with Africa. And um, over time, the African Union appears to have taken a stronger line against uh, the International Criminal Court. Now, there are a number of answers to this. The first is to say that actually there's a diversity of views amongst states within Africa as to the role of the International Criminal Court. And even within states, there's often a diversity of opinions. For example, in many countries, um, such as South Africa, for example, the judiciary appear to strongly support the role of the International Criminal Court, while politicians are perhaps uh, more doubtful about it. But as we've seen, the bulk of cases have come to the court, not through the prosecutor-initiated investigations, but through self-referral by African states or referrals by the Security Council, uh, again, of African states. So to some extent, the focus of the court has not been entirely the court's fault. Further, uh, in terms of making progress, one of the problems for the court has been acting upon Security Council referrals, where the Security Council has conferred power on the court, but not backed that with money. So a court funded by its member states has started doing uh, work, started investigating cases in non-member states without additional UN resources, and that has strained it. Um, further, the cases it has taken on, particularly in Africa, have not always been successful. So the Kenya situation proceedings against President Kenyatta and Vice President Ruto have collapsed completely and uh, were largely, in a sense, um, because those proceedings were opposed by the government of Kenya. Not surprising when one indicts the president and vice president. And there were allegations of witness tampering, but also simply it was very difficult to gather evidence in the absence of governmental cooperation. In terms of why African states may have begun to turn against the court, at least in uh, views expressed in political arena, a key turning point appears to have been that African states were very happy to use the court where they thought it might help a peace, justice and security process. However, when in the Sudan referral from the Security Council, the court proceeded to issue an arrest warrant against the president of the Sudan, President al-Bashir, that was seen as potentially undermining a peace process because it removed any incentive for uh, President Bashir to cooperate. Why would you negotiate a peace if you know that the result of those peace negotiations is that you'll be on trial in The Hague? Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about African states withdrawing from the International Criminal Court. But so far, there have only been two withdrawals from the court. Uh, Burundi uh, gave notice of intended withdrawal. A year passed, and that withdrawal became effective under the statute. And the Philippines has now given notice of its withdrawal. Though we should note that when you withdraw, that withdrawal is only prospective. Up until the date the withdrawal becomes effective, the court can still investigate crimes occurring within that time. So its temporal jurisdiction becomes bounded, but it will still have jurisdiction. Numerous other states have suggested they might withdraw from the Rome Statute, South Africa, the Gambia, Zambia, Kenya and Uganda, but none of those have succeeded yet. And in particular in South Af the South African case, uh, the purported withdrawal by the South African government was found to be um, unconstitutional by its courts. So the Rome Statute is now 20 years old, and one of the questions is whether the court itself is in crisis. So there's been considerable academic controversy about a lot of its case law. There have been quite contentious interpretations of provisions of the statute, dealing with, for example, the immunities of heads of state, such as 
President al-Bashir, how to correctly interpret the modes of liability that tell us when someone is sufficiently connected with a crime that they can be charged with it. Uh, the scope of the discretion of the prosecutor, as we've seen, the correct definition of the elements of crimes against humanity, the correct test for command responsibility, and so on, have all generated a lot of academic debate. But perhaps in a young court, we'll expect to see those issues of jurisprudence evolve over time. Perhaps more damaging to the court's authority is that um, President al-Bashir has now for the better part of a decade been completely free to travel in Africa despite having an ICC arrest warrant out against him. Uh, and if the court cannot secure uh, the presence of those it indicts, um, that would seem to be a blow to its authority. A significant controversy arised, arose late in the Katanga case where the prosecution had run a case that Mr Katanga was directly responsible for having committed certain crimes, but the evidence did not make out those charges. So, after all the evidence had concluded, the trial chamber announced that it would use Regulation 55 of the court's rules to recharacterise the case and would consider Mr Katanga's liability not, as it were, as a direct perpetrator of crimes, but as an aider and abetter. Now, that was terribly controversial because it affected the defence Mr Katanga should have run and no opportunity was given for further submissions and indeed the trial chamber went on to convict Mr Katanga as an aider and abetter and whether that constitutes a fair trial is something that's been fiercely debated. However, perhaps one of the biggest um, problems for the court's uh, authority or image or confidence in it has been its expense versus its tangible achievements. So it has been in operation concretely for more than 10 years, since 2007. It's had an annual budget in that time of between 80 and 140 million euros, that budget increasing each year. It has a staff of some 800, and in that time it has secured three, I'm sorry, four convictions in total, but one overturned uh, on appeal. And uh, in particular, there's been a very strong reaction to that first acquittal, the Bemba acquittal. Um, and when Mr Bemba was uh, convicted of responsibility for um, sexual offences in an armed conflict, but not for having directly committed them, but for being a responsible superior. So the issue was um, command or superior responsibility. And the appeals chamber found that uh, his conviction was not safe, and in particular that the test for superior responsibility had not been correctly applied, and so acquitted him. The prosecutor came out with a statement saying that this was a regrettable uh, development, and was the word actually used by the prosecutor was troubling, that she was troubled by this development. Uh, and indeed, civil society went on to say the crimes did not commit themselves to which Mr Bemba's defence team perfectly reasonably replied, the fact that crimes occurred does not mean our client was necessarily guilty of them. And indeed, the outcry was such that the President of the International Criminal Court, as it were, the Chief Justice of the International Criminal Court, had to make a further statement, as it were, um, rebuking the prosecutor. So the reaction here was very strong, and a sense maybe that after enormous expense and time and difficulty, a case that had run 10 years, that the prosecutor couldn't secure a conviction uh, was potentially a blow to the court's authority. And this leads to a question as to whether uh, the court has now reached a point of disillusion and fatigue. Uh, so on that slightly less than optimistic note, we will take up the conversation again in class uh, where we can consider whether there is um, cause for optimism uh, for the court's future going beyond 20 or whether indeed it is presently mired in crisis. Thank you. I look forward to discussing these issues with you more in class.